Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Motion Design Hotline. Oh boy, I can never really tell when the thing is going. Kyle, how are you doing? Uh, I'm great. You know, honestly, if we just did the show for the two of us, like, I wouldn't be too disappointed. <laughs> right. I mean, our... It's not our really nation. the point, though. Yeah. No, yeah, we're here to help people, Kyle. We are the Motion Design Hotline. We're here to help people with their After Effects problems. Uh, ostensibly, people send us their gripes, and uh, we attempt to um, come up with a G word that means to fix them. So, go, uh, go fix them. Yeah, so we go fix them. Yeah. Um, if you have questions, you can send them to us uh, using the form that is down in the uh, in the descriptions. Hello to everybody on YouTube. Hello to everybody on Behance. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, Kyle, there's other ways people can send us things. Um, yeah. Well, uh, we do have the uh, a form down there linked on the bottom. But of course, if you would like to see a real website for real people, you could right. go to motiondesignhotline.com where you can not only submit a question, but you could see past episodes and get project files like the ones we're going to have today. Today's aren't there yet. They will be, you know, a little bit after the show, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I was going to say people could like write us letters, but we don't have a PO. Oh, box right yeah, now, yeah, so yeah. We well, I, I was actually being helpful instead of ridiculous for okay. once well, in my life. That's true. <laughs> if if you put your question on a little post-it note like this, it will end up on my desk, and I will find it eventually. Yeah, that's that's our promise to you. We'll find yeah. it eventually. Um, so Kyle, what are we finding today? Uh, let's see. According to our notes, yeah. is. Per Persistent Path Problems, the mm -hmm. triple P. Um, as people know, we have alliterative show titles. That's how the show works. <laughs> Almost but, always. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Free, yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I shut you a, down. I'm not going to go on a word salad. We have, we have real work to do. So we are yeah. going to be talking about paths and animating things along paths uh, inside of After Effects, which... Mm -hmm looks great right um we see this when people are doing like explainer videos or they're doing kind of magical effects uh when they're doing um like write on techniques if we want to come back to our writing theme um but it's too early for a callback so it doesn't really feel right um <laughs> but i also want to say before we get too too down the line hello everybody who's hanging out with us uh in the chat wade holding it down moderating everybody bruce umicorn hello hello joshua what's going on uh oh pixie pooey hanging out yeah <laughs> after and go ahead i was gonna say after after put, putting on a master class right before this spending some time mm -hmm. with us here so love love all the work you do um what should we be doing i don't know kyle what, what did you have to uh, uh well here i'll i'll intro this concept a little bit because i think it's my fault um okay <clears throat> so uh you know in addition to taking questions that people specifically ask us sometimes we look at other things elsewhere on the internet i know that's um mind-blowing but uh, and sometimes we see things that like, huh, that might make a good thing to explain. Right. Um, so I was uh, uh, I was over on Reddit a couple weeks ago and saw oh. this bit where someone was asking how to do some specific things as something moved along the path, like a line along the path, but then it faded off. And there was a, a little ball that was kind of moving away from that path. So I was like, that seems like a good thing that like, is kind of straightforward to explain, but there's a lot of little things that go into making it work and making it usable. And there's a couple different ways to approach it. So yeah, seemed like a good topic. Oh, Kyle, you know what I forgot to do? I, I don't. The, oh, the thing. well, we haven't said anything uh, important yet, I think. So that's true. Okay. Here. Recording in progress. There we, there go. we go. Very, very official, very professional show here. This is our very professional start of the recording. Time starts Wink. now. <laughs> okay, Kyle, let's get into your screen because I think you have the most <laughs> straightforward version of uh, the two of these things. So yeah, yeah. So I kind of, um, I kind of just recreated the example that I had originally seen, and um, you know, I, I had sort of made some suggestions to that person's post. Uh, there on the Reddit, but um, now I'm going to make all kinds of suggestions to you fine people. Uh, so uh, in this particular example, um, uh, maybe you already saw this post on social media, but you're actually going to see it twice at 12 frames per second and then twice at 24, and then it's looping. So um, I don't know if the stream is going to even show you a difference, but uh, you can decide which one you like better because um, I couldn't. 
Yeah, and, are, you, are you team uh, 12 or team 24? You let us you know. know you. Yeah, yeah, let us know here. This is, uh, I haven't really been keeping score, but it feels like it's pretty close, honestly. Mm-hmm. So um, maybe we will tally, tally them up and I don't know what we'll do with it. But um, <laughs> what we will do, however, is talk about how I made this and how yeah. you could make something similar. Because uh, as you can see here, you know, we have a line following a path, which is fairly straightforward with shape layers. But then the tail is, um, in this case, not only uh, a bit tapered, although most of that is from the glow, to be honest, Mm. uh, it actually fades off as it gets further away from the the leading edge. Mm. And and then, uh, you know, crucially, this ball is kind of being thrown up off this path a couple times. So we'll kind of take a look at how that works. Um, also, I'm going to turn off Discord because it's exploding uh, in my ear, at least. Um, so sorry for that. Um, okay, so I have a little setup here uh, where I'm going to do kind of a slightly simplified version of that. I'll just kind of build it from scratch. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, as we go, please, if you have any specific questions about how uh, one particular thing is done, then uh, let us know. Seeing so, lots of love uh, for 12 frames a second in the chat. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, curious how uh, <laughs> somebody on YouTube said it looks like it's about four for them. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So I've already drawn out this line and this uh, ball here. So okay. um, just to kind of uh, oops, start from the beginning, I'll take this trim paths back off. So this is just a path that I drew with the pen tool. Um, and of course, when you start drawing without anything selected, you will just start making a shape layer. And then you just have to deser- uh, decide what you want. In this case, you could do, you know, a stroke and no fill. Pro tip, if you alt or option click on these little things up here, you can cycle through the different modes without having to actually click on it and uh, choose them like you do mm. there. Um, so I've already drawn this path. And then if we want that to draw on, that's um, as easy as coming to this little add menu in your shape layer. Unfortunately, that is not something you can do from the properties panel yet, but maybe someday. So I'm going to choose add trim paths. And then this is what gives you the ability to have this little start and end in here where you can animate that path on and off. I might go ahead and crank this stroke up just so it's a little easier for you folks to see right now. Mm. Um, And then I'm going to start this at zero and then come up to maybe about two seconds here and scrub this end value up to 100. And are you ready for this? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Um, (laughs) So, you know, that's the basics of drawing on a line, but obviously we want to make something much more interesting than that. So there's a couple different ways that you could do this. Um, One thing that I like to do a lot is just like maybe take those keyframes, copy them, paste them to start and scooch that over a few frames. And then that already gives you like a nice little line segment that can go across something. And especially once you start. (laughs) Fun little worm going across the screen. Yeah, fun little worm. And especially once you start easing those, um, I've always really liked how um, easily you can make something like really snappy and dynamic by like because it stretches out in the middle once you start easing those keyframes like that. But we're not going to be able to do that little thing today because we're doing something different. Um, So let's let's look at how to put this ball on the beginning of this line. Like there are some other things you could do. You could like make a trim paths that is Let's see, 56.1. You could make a trim paths that's uh, where your start value is always just like barely, barely, barely behind the end. And that Mm. becomes essentially a ball. Um, And that can be a good strategy if you want to kind of create some smears at certain points. Um, So that's one way to approach this. But what I want to use is uh, because we'll say that, you know, our ball is very specially stylized here. Okay. Uh, It just has a layer style on it. But Um, We'll say it's very specific. So we just want to stick it to the front of this path. And the easiest way to do that, well, tell you what, let me show you a way to do that. And then I'll show you the easiest way to do that. (laughs) Because, you know, we like options here. Um, So anything with a position property can 
can take a path because once you start creating uh, position keyframes, right? What you're creating is a motion path. Right. And these have Bezier handles. And so here's a little hint in case you've never done this. This is the same as any other path that you can create here in After Effects. So I can literally just take this path property from my shape layer, copy that, and then paste it directly into the position property of my ball. And so I can drag these over and looky there. It's following, but it's not. So the nature of shape layers is such that they have some internal position properties. So if you're doing this particular thing, it's not uncommon that you may have to kind of um, line this up by eye just to get it to match up. Um, and this is, you know, totally fine. This is totally workable. But one thing that makes this not ideal for what I'm trying to do is that it gets kind of tricky to use the graph editor for this because it's position property. We can't unlink these because it's going both up and down. So we'd have to switch over to the speed graph, which some people love, some people don't. Um, and then you'd have to start kind of figuring out, well, this is kind of the highest. So this is probably the slowest it's going to go. This is where it's going to be going the fastest because it has dropped down. And, you know, we could we could do some neat stuff here, but um, this is not really the approach that I want to take. Sometimes it works. So. <laughs> and if you thought that the 12 versus 24 debate was great, you should ask yeah, people oh boy. if they prefer speed versus value. <laughs> <laughs> if you want some artificial engagement, we can always do that. Um, so, but yeah, like it's inflexible, right? Like, and if you yeah. change the path, then you are got to change the other path or they got to manually. That's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's no good. It's um, I mean, it's all data. So, you know, yeah, too much work. <laughs> so instead, what we're going to do is uh, take advantage of a little script that is just included with After Effects. And it's not scary at all. It doesn't do anything, you know, frightening. <laughs> Um, and it will trace a selected path. So you could do this to a mask or a shape layer path like this. And you can just come up to window and look through your scripts. You may not have quite as many as I do. Um, it's called create nulls from paths. Like I said, it just comes installed with After Effects. And this is great. Like if you want to take a shape that you've drawn and tie each of those points to nulls, it does that. But one thing it also does is traces existing paths. So I'm going to tell it to trace this path. And then you'll see it creates a null object here. You can see it, that purple thing along the line. And uh, if I open this up, it has some keyframes and it traces that path. Okay. So if I wanted this to line up with the um, trim paths I already did, I could just stretch those keyframes out. And there we go. And then I could shift parent this ball to this null. Because when you shift parent, that will not only parent, but also move it to that position. There we go. And so if I do a quick preview, hey, looky there. So now my ball follows along at the front of that line. Um, one thing I will point out when you use this trace paths thing, it actually uh, by default loops this. If you don't want that, you can just disable the expression that it creates on this little progress slider there. But um, there you go. So now you can have a line follow a thing. Okay, easy enough. Done um, and so done. Done and done. <laughs> so part of this question was that we wanted the line to fade off, like, you know, maybe, maybe say around here, um, like the ball is creating this line. And then when it gets too far away, it, it starts fading off. Well, one pretty easy way to do that would just be to duplicate your ball. And we go ahead and kill the layer style, make this quite a bit bigger. And then add an effect like a Gaussian blur, maybe. And we'll go ahead and rename this thing too. We'll we'll call this Matt, and crank up this blur to a lot, um, a lot. There we go. Oh, and, we got a question in a question oh, in great. the chat. Theo's asking, "What is the way to do it so there's like a progress slider?" That is the way, right? You you currently have. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna point something out in just a second. Uh, okay. But that's exactly what's happening right now because. On both of these, so this this little null, the thing it actually creates is a little slider that's named progress, and it goes from zero to 100% of your path. And on trim paths, it's the same thing, from zero uh, of the end revealed to 100% of the end revealed. And I'm gonna do something in a second to make this even easier to work with. The fact that those numbers are the same is a, a big clue here. 
Um, okay, so I have uh, my mat here, although I do have a little bit of an issue. You can see it's kind of getting clipped. Um, <laughs> it's being a nasty and, mat. Yeah, but that's easy enough. I can just turn off, repeat those edge pixels here, and then boop, it extends the bounding box a little bit. Um, so in this case, I'm going to use this mat, which is also following that path because I told it to, right? Um, let's maybe adjust the size just a little bit. I think that's a little too big. Make it like that. Um, we can just tell the line to use that as a track mat. And now, hey, looky there. <laughs> yeah, easy peasy, right? Yeah. So now we have our ball with a line that follows it at a specific distance and then fades off. And one thing you might notice is that my path here starts and ends with a little straight path, right? And mm -hmm. the idea is that these are probably the ends of your, um, you know, our frame is probably actually, well, I don't want it on that one. Um, our frame is probably actually more like this. And then I'm just giving myself kind of a little extra runway on either side so that the ball can go off screen. So that's right. something that you want to think about if you're if you're doing something like this. Make sure, you know, you don't necessarily want to start right at the beginning because you might need a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of extra to charge up or to to go off the edge. Um, okay, so th this is fine right now, and having a couple different keyframes that that's okay. But if I want to start working with the speed of this, which you could see that my example had. Um, we're going to need, we don't want to be adjusting a whole bunch of different things, right? Mm -hmm. So remember, we're going from 0 to 100. And then on this property, we're going from 0 to 100. And they're the same thing, right? So what if we just got rid of these keyframes and linked it directly to that? Looky there. Same thing. Yeah. And so now we could start thinking about, um, I'm going to go ahead and disable this trim paths. Uh, sorry, not the trim paths. I'm going to disable that track mat so that we can see the whole path again. Um, because now is when we could kind of start thinking about like, well, do we want to do a little bit of graph editor work? I'm not going to obsess about this today, but we can kind of talk through the process. So let's make a keyframe here and maybe here when we're down at the bottom of this dip here, because that's going to be a place that's going to speed up quite a bit. And then when we get up to the top of this, that's going to be probably where it's going the slowest. And then when it comes back down, we'll we'll maybe make one here as it's kind of coming into that final thing. So, um, you know, these, uh, and, and we can adjust the timing too. Uh, you could um, <laughs> obsess over this for as long as you like. But the way that we're going to mess with these is to start adjusting these so that they go faster and slower at different points in the animation here. Right. I'm just going to hit F9 to go ahead and easy ease those. And then let's open up the graph editor. Let's go ahead and change this to the value graph, which I think might be a little easier to um, visualize in this case. Jeffrey's favorite graph. Yeah, good. <laughs> Hi, so um, right here at the bottom of the stiff, that's where it's going to be going the fastest, right? Yeah. So in that case, we'll want this to be going like, almost straight vertical here because that's that's the fastest it can be okay yeah so maybe maybe this is good for people who are not familiar with the differences between these two graphs yeah right yeah like vertical on the value graph means fast yeah and then if we jump over the speed graph real quick right high on the speed graph means fast. uh-huh yeah <laughs> yeah well more speed equals higher number here Whereas on the value graph, you can actually see the value of this thing changing from zero to 100. And then we're going to determine, in this case, I think it's easier to visualize like um, the way that we're actually moving through this thing over time, but it's mm. still increasing the whole time. Right. But it's it's equally valid valid if you're a speed graph person. Um, you know, we'll, We can switch back over in a second and see how this looks in here. Um, so, uh, you know, just to kind of touch the two most important things. So this is the fastest spot. And then this one, you know, we definitely don't want it to be evened out totally. So maybe just kind of going at about a 45 there, probably right. about the same on this one. Cause this one's going to be when it's kind of a landing here at the end, mm -hmm. you know, more or less constant, but here is where we want it to be really slow, but not totally nothing. You can see if I hover over here, 
if, if this is totally flat, that means the speed zero, it's gonna actually stop there for a second, which we don't want. So if we just kind of tweak these just a little bit so that it's, it's gonna hang up there, but not quite stop. Let's preview this and see how that feels. Woo, right, because anytime we go. the value graph goes flat, you're reaching a, a point of no movement. Yeah. So just by getting a just a wee bit off axis, you're in, you're inducing some change over time. Yeah. Uh, to yeah. that thing. And I see a question just popped up about using this in 3D. And yes, right. this would work exactly the same. Um, obviously, if you are if you're making a path that is rotated in some other dimension or something, you know, it becomes a little trickier to look at. Sometimes you might need to think about your camera angles or making yourself another camera to work with or something so you can see everything better. But, um, and obviously these are 2D layers. Uh, you could extrude them if you're using the other 3D engines and all that, but that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, because as soon as something has that third dimension, yeah. we're not drawing any, we're not drawing any 3D paths, right? We can't, we cannot draw a Unfortunately not. point. We can draw uh, motion paths that have three dimensions to them mm -hmm. and then if you use say a particle system to follow that right there's some yeah. some that will deposit their particles along uh in that way but uh <laughs> not shape layers i'm afraid uh yeah natively there's no way to draw a 3d line in after effects right uh just 2d lines in 3d space right um <laughs> yeah that's not confusing that's yeah. good <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so um i am not going to obsess over these curves today i think um I think what really needs to happen is that we'd need to kind of adjust uh, the position of these a little bit, um, the, the timing of these uh, touch, uh, now that we've kind of started playing with the, um, you know, the, the speed of them. But uh, I think this is good enough. It gives the idea here. Right. So let, let's go ahead and re-enable that uh, mat now that we have seen what we're, what we're doing here. Um, I think that's, you know, feeling pretty good. But the other challenge as, as part of this was to have the ball leave this path and then return to it, right? Um, and, you know, I could think of a couple different ways that you could do that. You could maybe, um, you could keyframe the position of the ball separately from the path because it's following, but I'm not sure. Um, I mean, we, you know what? L let's try it real quick and just see what mm -hmm. happens. Um, it certainly could work. Uh, in this case, maybe we'll just kind of go up a little bit and then I'll bring that position back to zero here. In this case, it might be easier to separate those dimensions. Let's just see. I'll just kind of easy ease those. Let's see how that works. It, it may be okay. Mm, kind of. I mean, it, kind of. And, you know, yeah. there's some graph editor work needed here. Let's kind of like, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time with this. But just as an idea, this, you know, this might work in some cases where you could, mm, it's, yeah, it's strange the way it's coming off of that path. I think well, yeah, almost because it is, to... it's tangentially, right? It's yeah. like yeah. tangentially locked to that thing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say that that's not the approach, um, but there might be times where that works. Uh, but what I'm actually doing uh, for my example is I just made another path. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna copy my uh, my layer there, duplicate that. I'll go ahead and get rid of the mat, and let's um, change the stroke color to something else so that we can see it. Um, and then I'll open up this path property, and just send the ball where I actually want it to go, which is maybe up here. Okay. Mm. And so we're not gonna see this path. I'm just kind of drawing this to um, you know show us. Let's maybe uh, turn off that trim path so that we can kind of, eh, and that track mat again, so we can kind of visualize this better. Because not only do we need to redraw it, but I think we need to kind of like edge this over a little bit. And if you think about it, I don't think this ball is going to come right here. We actually probably want to kind of throw it a little bit to the side. And so there's just a lot of like massaging that you might need to do here. Um, again, I'm going to call this good enough. And so what we might actually want is to our to attach our ball to this path here. And as long as it's the same most of the time, this is going to work great. So um, let's go ahead and run that little uh, tracer script again. Just need to select the actual path property and trace. Okay, and so this is tracing line two here. 
we can go ahead and turn this off because it's just for reference. Get that mat back. And then let's tell our ball instead to trace line two. Okay, well, I'm not sure what happened there. Well, actually, it's because <laughs> the timing is totally different. Right. Well, let's go ahead and just kind of clear some of this out. And then we could tell this to be uh, following our trim paths uh, percentage, right? <laughs> Except if you think about it here, let, well, I've gone too far. Uh, let's, let's do this. Um, if you think about it, our trim paths is not going to be accurate anymore here. Right. Because the 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 good and bad thing about building it like this is that um now the numbers are different right um right because the length is different the percentage yes. doesn't mean the same thing yes this new path that i drew is longer than the old one and so what you would have to do is kind of come in here and you'd want to link this one to this trim paths on your second line instead here and then we need to kind of like adjust some of these numbers because the bottom of, you know, where the first line is coming to maybe here. Um, let's turn that trim paths back on. Uh, yeah, look, look at how big of a difference we have here. So you need to come mm. and adjust these numbers. And like our, uh, you know, our speed values and stuff, those can probably stay largely how they are. But yeah. you'll need to kind of sync these back up. And so in this case, like changing the path later might be tricky. But you can, you know, with with a little more tweaking than I've done here, like that's not too hard to throw a thing up off the path and then have it reconnect. Um, you just need to kind of be aware that you're dealing with some slightly different numbers between the two things because the paths are not the same length anymore. That's true. Now, Kyle, we've hit about the halfway point. So yeah. I feel like I must uh, I must show you a, must. A, a, I, a I've yapped long enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And enough of these numbers that mean the same thing. I'm so tired of numbers that are the same things. <laughs> I want numbers that are that mean different things. So we're going to, I'm going to take that same idea, right? We're going to put a thing on a path. And then what I want to do, I want to get more data out of the path. That's what I want to mm. be doing, right? So Kyle has showed us thing following path. I've got a thing following a path. I got Santa here skiing down the hill, right? He's, they're following the path. Um, we, uh, we cannot speak to the, the sort of, uh, inner workings of a Santa. I think they're kind of a, an unknowable creature. Yeah, um, that's a magical being. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but if we really dial in here and show you, uh, what's, what's going on in the inner workings here, we do indeed, Hey, look at that. It's our old, it's that trace path, mm -hmm. uh, that's back, right? Tres leches, Andy, Andy. trace path. And <laughs> it's doing a lot of work, right? Um, I have also, actually, you know what? Let me just, I'll, uh, let's roll it on back to where my path even comes from is probably a good thing to start with. So I know in my heart of hearts that the place that I want that this particular project to go is this kind of eternal looping of skiing down a hill, right? So I need the path that the, the Santa uh, we'll go the the bonhomme de Santa over here. Um, and that means that I don't just need the one segment. I actually need th about three times the segment. Now, I could probably get away with, with just doubling the segment. But what I did here in Illustrator uh, was I drew a path. I like to kind of hold down shift when I when I draw these paths so that I'm making sure that my tangents are going totally vertical. Um, and then I just duplicate one, two, three of them, stick them on top of each other, command J to join the points. And then I push this path back into After Effects. So if I know that the distance of travel that I want for one segment of Santa is to, to go all of 600 pixels, well, out here, I'm going to make something that is thrice the height, right? A thrice heighted comp here to make my one, two, three, uh, uh, paths, right? My one, two, three passes of the same thing. And we roll that back. We take this comp. And if we, we know that each of those passes, each of those duplicates is, you know, 900, um, 
pixels. Well, if I shift this by 900 pixels constantly, well, then that's going to create the loop, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's the that's the scoop on the loop. So <laughs> then then we simply have to we time remap the journey. What, what what is the journey that this Santa is on? Well, they're going from 33 and a third to 66 and a sixth. Um, that's their journey. They're they're only taking the middle section. That's all that they're doing. They're just doing the middle. But that's going to give us the after and the before, which thankfully will be exactly the same. Um, and that's going to kind of complete the illusion. Now, what's happening in between there? We saw Kyle do it once. Right? So I'll, I'll show you how I does it. Um, if you are more of a speedster, if you're more of a... <laughs> that, that's what we'll call the speed graph yep. people. Um, if, if you're if you're a speedster, if you tap into the speed force, um, stand up and cheer moment. We, ta we tap into that speed force. Um, this is what your speed graph will likely look like if you're if you're doing it like this. So I set keyframes where I wanted the Santa to slow. Right. This is the I want him to be slowing into the turns. I don't know anything about skiing, but I'm going to assume that this is helpful for not dying that he's going to lose a lot of his momentum when he, when he, you know, speeds up in the straight sections. Oh, high point. That means fast. Mm -hmm. And then slows into there. So we're literally just setting ka frames. So let's say it started out, you know, a little bit like this. We've eased, we've eased the journey, but we know that on a speed graph, when we contact, when we clunk, hit the bar, mm -hmm. we hit the bottom, we're running into no speed. So what we want is to set ka frames. And in particular, Double click on this, it's gonna say keyframe velocity. You want continuous, lock outgoing and incoming. And that's gonna allow you to grab this and move it up and down. This mm -hmm. will be a point at which we slow, but we do not stop. So that's when we end up with a little something like this where we pull and the I, handles. And I think in your example where you're, it's not constant, but you're kind of just slowing it down. Whereas mine was like intentionally going very slow and very fast in different places. Yes. That, that feels like, at least in my example, that would have been harder to visualize in the speed graph. Right. Actually, let's have a look at the old value graph. You see mine, like mm -hmm. this changes a lot subtler yeah. between here, right? So, and that's, it's harder to be like, oh, I got to tweak this by a little, this by a little, this by a little. It's way more noticeable on the other format of the graph so in those ways well, we're so what we're saying is use both when it That's matters right. or when it, when it makes sense yeah yeah what's that uh, what's the meme uh <laughs> que los dos <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one that we want. Uh, people correct me, correct my Spanish. Por qué no los dos? Uh, Por qué no los dos? Yeah. See, sí. okay, bueno. Um, that's perfect. We're nailing it. Um, so that's how we get this the Santa speed. But look, there's so much movement happening in here, Kyle. Look at all the nuances of Santa. There's so many interesting things happening. Surely I must have placed way more keyframes than just these. No. No, comment. surely no, and no. don't call me Shirley. <laughs> Never. Uh, we, <laughs> we we don't want to be setting more keyframes than we want. If we can derive movement from the path, then you, you can just adjust all of these things, and everything about Santa will will align to those uh, different changes. So let's try to go through this kind of one element at a time, and I'll try to try to get into. Sort of what's going on. I'll make these trees go away. Uh, let's make Santa go away. And let's just look at the short, speed. short version. Lots of expressions. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're just going to let's just observe the skis, right? When the skis are alone, what should skis do as they go down the hill? Right. Let's well, try to fly off in different directions because no one's on them. That's right. Pizza, fries, pizza, yeah. fries. Close your eyes. Get a surprise. So that's. <laughs> That's skiing. Um, in this case, what I have here are just a couple of rectangles. So if we go to like a basic pointing down the hill, right? Pointing down the hill, there are two rectangles that are that are pointing forward. As we turn, I want the skis to align with the direction of the path. Now, there's some great tools that we can use to make that happen. Within the contents, within the group, we have a rectangle, and then we have a transform of that group. 
right? So, I mean, if we named this skis, and then this, as you can see, is the transformation of the group called skis. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to change the skew and the skew axis. So if I just go ahead and disable for a moment, whoa, oh. the, <laughs> the expression, uh, I'll put this to zero. Um, you can see that by skewing, hey, skewing is kind of close to what we want, right? That's that's doing it. Mm -hmm. And if we were to, I'll just reactivate this so it looks, looks good. The skewing should be related to the rotation, uh, a rotation, you say, of this null, which... This rotation of the null, it's got, it's got a bunch of garbage in here. Don't read that. Yikes. The, the important <laughs> thing is that this is following the tangent of the path, right? So ta tangent path. You know I love to go to tangent town. This will be no exception. But if you observe the rotation of this, we are at 90 degrees currently, and we're going to swing. If this were to go totally horizontal, if they were to ski free power slide right onto here, then... It would, it would go to zero, right? This would approach zero. And as it's twisting back the other way, it's going to like 180. So we can think about this oscillating between 180 to zero. And that's what's going on um, as it journeys down the mountain. So from that, if I want to control the skew, I'm really just pulling in that rotation value for a variable <laughs> I've called rot. And then I'm making a variable I call input, which is going to ease that rotation, as it goes from zero to 180, it's gonna go from negative one to one. Hmm, what an, in what an interesting thing to do, negative one to one, what does that mean? And well, if I can very briefly interrupt, just yes, in case you haven't seen it before, you've probably seen us talk about linear before. Ease is the same, it's just eased, um, but it's the same format, it's the same uh, functionality there, where quickly you can you know turn one kind of property into another, or- right to find the range that it's covering. Yeah, so we're remapping zero to negative one and 180 to one. So when the rotation is zero, the input variable is negative one. When the rotation is 180, the input value is one and everything in between. And the important thing is that easing bunches the values mm -hmm. uh, towards either end, which is gonna provide a bit more of a natural vibe to this. If this were linear, not as fun. Um, and not as correct, I don't think. I was basically trying to approximate uh, sine waves and stuff without having to do as much math. Uh, so <laughs> with this, I've then multiplied that by 60. So the final output is negative 60 to 60, right? We're swinging that far as we're, hold on, I'm gonna do a skiing motion here and that'll be that'll be very helpful for people to, to get this. <laughs> the other part is, well, hey, wait a minute. Well, I need to do a similar thing. I'm going to do a similar thing to the skew axis. So the actual axis on which we're skewing is doing a similar thing. So we're getting a bit of a compounded look here. Um, let's see. What is the best way to do a, a look a look yeah. at in 2D? Hmm. Yeah, Joel had a question about look at. And um, uh, you're kind of sort of doing a look at here, but there is a way to specifically have a layer look at another object. But um, right. I, that's a whole other code thing, which honestly might be a great uh, future topic um, because I know that that's come up before. So I, I already wrote it down as okay, a note. <laughs> oh boy, I hope one of us is writing that down. Um, yeah. So that's how we got the skis going, right? Now there's another part of the skis. Remember Evan, the someone ski? is asking why 60 degrees. Oh, uh, I kind of just made it up. Um, so... <laughs> That's the short answer. Um, the 60, right? So remember, we've got, the, we've got the 60, which is the skewing amount. So it's not really degrees, it's amount of skew. Now, I don't believe that that skew value actually corresponds to a degree of any form. Um, having skewed things to 45 and being aghast that they were not yeah, 45 yeah. degrees. So remember- Oh, it's just eyeballing it. Yeah, so the skew is going to 30, and I put the skew axis change to 30. Compounding those together, we get the type of motion that I was after, right? Cool. Now, it's important to remember, I'm not necessarily trying to be mathematically perfect. I just want it to look correct. So that's why I was, like, I've tried 50, tried 40, tried 75, right? I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm pushing back and forth, you know, over those. Now, I'm sure 
a mathematographer could tell you, you know, the correct type of thing. That's what their profession is called. Um, but I, 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 I can't get there uh, with it because it's also a little bit messed up because we are combining the two ideas, right? Because we're combining angle and amount. Uh, now we're adding too many variables. <laughs> so we kind of got to, we kind of got to mix the sauce to get it the way we want. Um, what was I saying? Something about rotation. Um, right. So the skis are parented to this object, right? Now, if we didn't perform this little trick of the rotation of that, I'm going to disable that and we're going to see how poor this is going. So now the skis are going crazy. They're flip de whooping all <laughs> over the place, right? This is that's not how you ski. That's how you I I kind of want to see the little Santa skiing like that though. Well, doing, I mean, Santa, doing full Santa's, 360s. Look, Santa's got his own problems going on. So yeah. like now his ankles are being totally <laughs> destroyed. I don't, honestly, like he's ready for the X Games here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he can bend time and space, so it's unfair. He's disqualified. Now, what we've got going on here is a very simple look at the thing you're parented to and just deny mm -hmm. its rotation by multiplying by negative one. And that would that causes the, the layer that is skis, that layer is not doing anything. So the label, mm -hmm. the layer has basically been stabilized and all of the rotation that it looks like it's doing... Um, <laughs> turn into Dr. Evil for a minute there, um, <laughs> is is all down to the skew, right? I'm denying all of the rotational stuff that's going on. Now, the same thing is going on with Santa. Santa here, they're, they're, I'm denying their rotation as well with the same method. But they got a few more, they got a few more things going on that are derived, again, staring back at the values that we've previously established. So... We've got a skew that's wobbling, you know, back and forth. So if we, you know, just get back into there and observe that skew, do, 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 transform of skis, look at skew, right? So this, as you know, is oscillating between negative uh, 60 and 60. So that could be a good point for us to look at when we are thinking about, well, what should the head of Santa be doing? Well, when we reach this point, it should be right in the middle, but when it's sort of here on the extremes of the trail, it should be jutting out in front because they're, you know, they're leaning forward as they're, as they're skiing down the hill. So the group called head in here has the transform of head. And if we go into the position, we are basically just taking the skew of the layer and I'm just, you know, taking the existing value and and multiplying by like a fifth of the skew, right? So subtracting. And was that again just kind of a guess? To yeah, like look, if I want yeah. if I wanted them to have like a bit more of a, a sort of like a pronounced like their head is really detached from their body, you can see mm -hmm. how that's going. Right. Giraffe Santa. <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's good to point stuff like that out because a lot of times, you know, people get intimidated by expressions, but a lot of times it's just. Uh, link to this thing and then, I don't know, divide it by two? Nope, that doesn't yeah. look right. Five? Eh, yeah, better. Yeah. Um, a lot of times you're just kind of, you know, linking to one thing and then dialing it in a little bit. Yeah, we're just we're just kind of figuring it out, you know. Um, but the other thing that has to happen, right, the legs got to stay on the skis. That's yes. pretty critical. Uh, leg, legs got to be on skis. Even and for Santa. So, yeah. So part of that is down to what I did to, I mean, the legs, sorry, the legs are just repeated. So they're pushed kind of apart from each other. And in order to do that, I again fed the skew back in. So give me that negative 60 to 60 number. But, 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 here's something super critical to remember. The skew is going negative 60 to 60. But I don't really care about the negative part. So I'm using math.abs. I'm taking the abs the the core so i'm removing the no, removing the negative that's how you can remember what uh, math.absolute does uh it's you're looking at the core of the integer without the negative sign <laughs> um and so we're only taking that so the negative 60 to 60 has now become 60 to 0 to 60 again right so it's it's going like dipping back up to the positive oh boy i don't Kyle, I, I don't think that was very helppful, but I'll, I'll think I'll think about a nicer way to say that. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but just remember, math not absolute. We're taking away the negative, so we're only dealing with magnitude, not direction at this point. Yeah, that's so a good way to say it. The direction now, and we're gonna take that 
Let's take that absolute value and divide it by eight. And again, I had to really massage this to try to find the number to get the feet to line up on the skis here and then the feet to line up on the skis here. So there we go. <laughs> but what does core day have to do with leg day? Uh, <laughs> your legs are attached to your core. <laughs> That's critical. Maybe yours are. Don't, don't presume. That's true. I'm built like one of those um, Mr. Man cartoons. Um, so uh, just uh, Google those children's books and you'll see sort of an orb with legs attached to it. That's my uh, sort of ideal physical form uh, that I'm going for. <laughs> anyway, that's Santa, right? So all of the parts of Santa are just variations on that theme of stuff that has to get closer and further apart as the Santa turns or stuff that needs to move laterally left, laterally left and right as the Santa turns. And that's pretty much it. Now, uh, I did a little bit of the Trimothy paths. We got trim paths going on the trail mm -hmm. back here, which is, of course, following. It's following the progress, following that progress. Same thing that Kyle did. I'm, I'm, I'm biting Kyle's rhymes to produce this stuff. And that's pretty much what gets you here with Santa sliding on down. Now, of course, I went ahead and, and basically undid all of my hard work. Like, this looks really nice with smoothie Santa uh, mm -hmm. skiing down the mountainside. Um, but then I went ahead and posterized everything to 12 frames per second. So it <laughs> kind of gets crunchitized. And and you uh, didn't do an engagement trap of asking people which one looked better. No, that's true. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I fumble the bag more times than I grasp it. I'm afraid <laughs> it's the story of my life, but that's how we get this kind of really procedural Santa mm -hmm. that we don't have to, um, work as hard. So if I wanted to make changes to the velocity of the Santa or, or how they're going or, or any of that stuff, it's the only manual inputs are these keyframes. The, the speed. Yeah, exactly. The speed, you could, the you could enter a whole new path and just have to adjust the speed keyframes, right? Yeah, exactly. And so that would be just copying and pasting and putting in a different, a, a different, I, you know, the path has mm -hmm. to be the way this is set up, three identical segments of path, right? That is, mm -hmm. a, that is a critical thing in this system. Um, but speaking of the other things that are kind of in thirds, and I think we'll, we'll see this when we go back to your screen, right? To produce the idea of a loop, not only does the path need to be thrice repeated, but mm -hmm. all of the scenery is also yeah. thrice repeated. So if I just solo uh, some of our tree groves here, Right. This is using the repeater. So if we, mm, nice. let's, re, let's, let's really get in here. We've got, take it all back to a single tree. Hmm, nice tree, Evan, you say. And then we repeat the tree. So I'm repeating horizontally the tree. Then I'm wiggly transforming of the tree. Okay, so it's a little bit randomized. And let's uh, repeat it going vertically. Let's randomize that. You can turn your repeaters into like tiny particle systems, right? Um, which is how we end up with this little cluster of trees. Mm -hmm. And then the final repetition is to say, we need three copies, offset them by one. So the, the OG is the middlest of them. Now that's not totally necessary, but what is super necessary is right here, this value. They're 600 apart from each other. 600 was the magic number of the vertical displacement of the path, right? Each path segment is 600 pixels in a loop from each other. 600 is the magic number. Um, and that leads us to have this grouping of, of things that are 600 apart, this grouping of things that are 600 apart, these groupings of things that repeat every 600. So this is one, two, three repetitions. And then you end up with these trees that more or less look contiguous as they form this this sort of a path that we're going down. It's all smoke and mirrors, though, right? <laughs> this guy is not snaking amongst the trees. This, this right. person is only ever behind the trees, and it is the undulation of the path that makes you think maybe he would go in front of a tree, but he won't. You'll never see it. Uh, you just come close to seeing it, and your mind makes up the difference. I tricked you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and now that I've revealed my nasty little tricks, uh, let's go, let's go back to Kyle. Well, I mean that's that's a good uh, that that is a great segue back to mine. So um, yeah. obviously, with this demo thing that I was building here, you know, I'm just working in this one comp, but um, I'll show you my the the comp that I built for my actual tracer. Uh, the, my actual example, and you'll see this is actually quite large. 
So this is 5,000 pixels wide and 2,200 pixels tall. Um, I kind of just uh, messed around until I found those. But then the actual export that I did is 1080 by 1080. And, and it's right. because the whole thing is just keyframing that within this so that I uh, I took advantage of this graph um, or this uh, grid that is the background for my comp as a way that I could match those up on the last frame to create mm. a continuous loop. Yeah. Um, and without that grid, um, I mean, maybe it would still work fine, but I don't know how well you'd really be able to tell like um, that this thing is moving. Right, um, you lose the context of its movement when that Yeah, exactly. Stuff is Let going. me turn off some of these glows and stuff. There's quite a bit going on there, but um, there's some compositing and uh, I don't know if we'll have time to get into it. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of a thing uh, moving <laughs> uh, here. I can turn off that mini max and we'll at least get part of this here. But, um, you know, you can still see that it's moving, but it's not nearly as effective because you have no context. So, right. um, you know, just think about uh, kind of working in, uh, if you are trying to make a perfect loop, um, you know, remember to give yourself context like that, but also like you can build a thing in one place and then reframe it and manipulate that to make your loops um, somewhere else. Um, now, I, I saw did, questions. I to... Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, so Rick was saying no 3D layers. Uh, that's true. Usually when I deploy this type of thing, I'm making, I'm making the big path, making the mm -hmm. big comp filled with the path. I'm making it 3D and then I'm observing that through a camera. That's usually what I'm mm -hmm. yeah. doing. But in this case, no, they're all, it's, we did it all 2D. We did, we did the 2 d yep. way. Um, to do it. Um, were there but, other quandaries but, that were coming in the chat? What, well, we there was a here? more general question. Um, over okay. on YouTube, uh, Armando was kind of asking about um, getting started in After Effects. And, you know, uh, if I do this a couple hours a day, you know, will I be decent in a month? Um, and I just thought that was sort of a good thing for us to both speak to because decent oh, yeah. is, is very relative. But um, if you, it, it sounds like you already have some understanding of Photoshop. So what I would recommend is, you know, find some design that you've already done um, and think about the things that could move and right. then start exper just bring them over and even just do simple things where you have, you know, one hero piece and some text or something like that and experiment with different ways to move those on and off screen or what they can do once they're there. Um, and honestly, once you can do that, like that's already hireable work in a, a lot of cases. Um, yeah. you know, Evan and I have each been doing this stuff for, you know, 15 to 20 years. Um, yeah. and there's things that we know really well. And honestly, there's other techniques that I bet neither of us have ever tried. So, um, yeah. it's, it's, you know, do you have any wisdom you want to dispense there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I see this question a lot. If I put in this many hours a day for right. this many mm -hmm. days, will I become ba ba ba? Sure, I guess it really depends on what you're doing for four hours, right? Yeah, like yeah. it's hyper critical that you are like achieving and trying and pressing stuff. If I made bread for four hours a day every day, I'd become pretty awesome at making bread, provided yeah. I'm not just making the same loaf of bread every day. Yes, right. Like I don't know, and and so we talk about this like a lot in sport and in any kind of teaching thing, like if the goal is to get you amazing at a single technique, then we're going to drill that thing, that thing four hours a day, every day, you will have an unstoppable Uchimata. That's a judo thing for anyone who's curious. Um, but like, if you did that, imagine the reps you would have, you would, you would have an almost undefeatable singular technique. You would be incredibly brittle because you would only <laughs> have the one thing, right? You've got the one mode and that's how you do it. Um, but, if you are constantly within that time pushing yourself into the boundaries and being super critical of what you've done with your time. Um, and all those techniques are going to kind of overlap and build on each other as you go. Yeah. And like, like, I don't know, daily practice, doing the reps and stuff like that. That is super helpful as long as you are having a productive time mm -hmm. of study uh, is kind of the, the really important part. <laughs> <laughs> that that it's it's you gotta have a curriculum of study like that can be very accelerated uh you can do more with less time if you are being much more efficient with how you are 
applying yourself and what you are learning and the, the avenues you do that. And part of that, hey, uh, set aside an hour of your day to come and hang out with us every week uh, is a great, <laughs> a great way to do that, if I could say it, because we're going to present you with stuff. We're going to challenge you to do things. Mm -hmm. Kyle, we're coming into the end of the show. Uh, which we is are. That's why I have to do this kind of wrap-up thing. We are going on break for a little bit, but we're going to be back in the new year, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you are trying to get into After Effects, if there are things about the program that frustrate you and confuse you, just let us know. We'll do a whole yeah. hour about it, right? Like, <laughs> that's yeah. what we do around here. Um, so tell us what irks you. Tell us what you're trying to accomplish. If you see something cool out in the world and you're like, how do I do this? You know, how do I make one of those? Send it to us. We will. Yeah. We will explore. We will. That's what. That's what uh, inspired today's show. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you gotta send us the stuff. We'll help Sherpa you at least halfway there. Uh, maybe we can point you in the right direction. Some things, obviously, in an hour. You know how much. You know. Right. Leg. Leg. Where we gonna get on that? Legway. I don't know. Legway. Leeway, yep. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the idea. That hopefully we can point you in the right direction. So send us things that you find challenging. And uh, challenge us. Bring it on. Uh, that's what we want to do. Um, so, uh, I don't know. Any last words here, Kyle? We're going to get cut off yeah. pretty soon. But uh... I know. Well, uh, you know, any of those challenges? Well, you know, ha have a great rest of your year, everybody, and good holiday season and such, uh, whatever thing you may or may not do. Um, hit us up at motiondesignhotline.com. Send us your questions, uh, anything that you want to know. Or, you know, if you just want to get yourself a, a really cool hat, you can do that, too. <laughs> um, but you know, be, be good to yourselves, be good to each other. And we'll see you in January. It's true. The hats are cool. I'm Evan Abrams. Find me online at EC Abrams. You can find Kyle online at Kylosaurus Rex, motion design hotline.com, a real website for real people. Until next time, stay creative, be kind to each other, and we will see you around the internet. Bye for now. <laughs> Catchphrase.